Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 208 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyle, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. Remember, you can try strengthcoach.com out for three days, just a buck. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. Check it out at strengthcoach.com. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Renna, and the show notes are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. If you want to get in touch with me, shoot me an email to strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. All right, Perform Better has the get a free pack of mini bands when you spend over $50. Who doesn't like mini bands? Uh, they also have items on sale like super bands, FMS tets, test kits, uh, the Mega Trap Bar, First Place Fitness Mats, and the Economy Ultimate Sandbag. And the summits are here. Providence is the next stop on June 22nd, so register now at performbetter.com. A few episodes ago, we had on Eric Cressy, Charlie Weingroff, and Coach Dose talking about their topics at the summit, so check those out. Lots of amazing speakers, including our very own Mike Boyle. Check it out at performbetter.com. All right, speaking of Coach Boyle, for the Coach's Corner, I have him on talking about using heel boards and wedges uh, and a study that came out recently and all about character. We talked about that because he uh, posted an article that he was really into and uh, we got a lot of a lot of uh, talk on the uh, on the forum. So we uh, I talked to Coach Boyle about that. We expanded on that. That and much more coming up on the Coach's Corner. For the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment, Alan Cosgrove is on to discuss doing an audit of yourself. This is an interesting exercise that he recommends doing quarterly. For the Functional Movement System segment, I have a segment f- from a video that Greg Cook did on functionalmovement.com. You can get the link at shrinkcoachpodcast.com if you want to actually watch the video. But Greg talks to us about some motor control screens. He goes over the why and the how. For the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach, I have on Jana Heitmeyer. And Jana is the Director of Sports Nutrition at Baylor University. I spoke to Jana all about everything her job entails, including nutrition education for the student athletes, working with the chefs and the coaches at the university, arranging travel meals, technology she uses, sleep, supplementation, and the challenges of her job. Great stuff coming up from Jana in a little while. Lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Coach, you're back from Orlando. How are you doing? Back from Orlando. I'm doing great. Back from Orlando. High school graduation yesterday. So Mikhail is now a high school graduate. Time is marching on. Wow. It's crazy. Saw Mikhail's uh, prom pictures. Just like hard to believe. Hard to believe. Jeez. Uh, I tell everybody. I was talking to some people today. I said, time really does fly. Man. Um... How was Florida? I mean, I saw like a lot of a lot of positive uh, stuff. People were loving the presentations down there. Uh, a lot of a lot of activity on social media about the uh, the. How did your uh, presentation go? I think it went really well. I, I always think mine. I, I gauge it really based on the number of laughs, and there seemed to be a lot. So people like it. It's a, it's funny. Usually, I'm tired of the presentation by this time. And this one, I'm really not. I'm thinking, wow, I only get to do this one two more times, and then I have to retire it. So it's, uh, but I think it went well. Good, good stuff. All right. Um, Coach, let's talk about a topic um, that basically has been kind of uh, a lot of activity lately on your social media and then, you know, on on the forum. And that's the heel boards and wedges. Um, and, and you actually posted a, uh, a study, the effects of a heel wedge on hip, pelvis, and trunk biomechanics during squatting and resistance trained individuals. Let's take a step back because I think people have this misunderstanding that you never do anything bilateral. But that's – you teach people right away the bilateral squat, and that would be with a goblet squat, first of all. Um, and your progression would be goblet. And if they can't get – if they're not doing well, you'll elevate the heels. And if they're not doing well, you'll you'll – use a band around the knees. Just give us an overview of that, and then we'll talk about the effects of the heel wedge. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 
it's interesting. I think the cool thing about the site, in all honesty, is that there's so many people now who are really grasping what we're doing with a lot of depth. So there are some things I think that surprise them. So they see like Mark with a heel board and they think, I can't believe you're letting your son use a heel board. That was why I posted. But I look at it and think, and I've, fit, I've said the same thing. I actually had this conversation a bunch of times with people. People, lifters have been squatting with heels for as long as I've been around the sport, 40 years. Mm-hmm. In the sense that Olympic lifting shoes are heeled. Power lifters would squat in work boots in meets. And that's what that study reinforced is that there is a change in trunk angle that comes from that little bit of heel lift. And it's not a lot. We're talking about probably something between a half inch and an inch, but it does change the kinematics in a really positive way. And I, my whole thing is that if I'm squatting for lower body strength and I know again, philosophically that the weak link is their low back in terms of the area where they're inclined to get injured, then to me, it makes perfect sense to use that heel board or that wedge or plates under the heels or a board or whatever it is you're using to give you a more upright trunk. It's sort of a win, win, win kind of thing for me. And I I think the problem that people get into is because of kind of the big emphasis in, you know, FMS and a lot of these things that people get caught up in the, you know, sort of mobility, you know, don't put strength on top of dysfunction. And you're like, I get that, but I don't think that's really what we're talking about when you start looking at this and someone, you know, again, a real purist is going to argue, yes, it is. There's an ankle mobility deficiency. And my whole thing is there isn't probably as much of an ankle mobility deficiency as there is the fact that everybody isn't made to squat. Everybody doesn't have the perfect sort of relationship of tibia length to femur length to spine length that allows them to be that really good kind of upright Olympic style squatter that we'd want. And the heel lift gives us that, you know, to a much greater degree, much faster. So it's just one of those things that I'm all for. And I think that's why I have been kind of throwing it out there for people to see and, and then trying to reinforce kind of the why behind it. I had somebody else, they said, you know, if you go look at, um, there's quite a bit, I think between all of the books between, you know, advances and new functional training for sports and even, you know, the designing strength training programs that's on the site. There's quite a bit of talk about that whole idea. And to me, it's just one of those things. It makes tremendous sense from a safety perspective. Why would you not do it? Yeah, I think um, going back to even like that, the mess of gray originally had been talking a lot about it even like, because I've, I've done some things where somebody did have good ankle mobility um, and, um, but they still didn't have a great squat. So it was more of a patterning thing. So it was almost like an, it's like an R and T thing. So the fact that the heel, and this is a higher heel, like the, uh, the, the FMS kit, the, the board is pretty high. So it's kind of pushing somebody forward. So that first inclination is to kind of get yourself back and push the hips way back. So I've seen that, that pattern really clean up. So never mind, like, uh, obviously, we're giving them and the we're giving them the ankle mobility. But I've tested the ankle mobility on some people and been like, "Wow, they do have good ankle mobility." They're still not doing this, and it was so it wasn't really that. It was more of a a patterning thing. So I think it helps with that as well. I think it does, and that's what you look at if you see sort of because if you think again, if you are an FMS purist, what does Gray always say? Symmetrical twos, you're good to go, right? What gives you that symmetrical two, or just the two in the case of the squat because it's bilateral, is the heel lift. Suddenly, yeah. if you can squat with the heel lift, you're a two. Yep. Which means, in the implied sense, that means that it's okay to squat with a heel lift. <laughs> yeah. Right? You know what I mean? If you, again, even if you are that FMS purist, you can look at that and think, okay, this is, you know, this is what the screen says, which again is what, you know, we get a lot of people who are concerned with that idea. This is what the screen says. So, um, I think it still tells us that we can do that. Absolutely. Good stuff. Um, what did that study officially say? The effects of heel wedge on hip, pelvis and trunk biomechanics. Yeah, it just said that heel wedge improves squat kinematics, that, that the trunk lean was less with a heel lift than without, which again, I've been doing a lot of publishing some of these really obvious studies. I Instagram a study today, a picture of another one that was talking about the fact that in, in weight loss, a strength training plus interval training group beat 
out a strength training only and an interval training only group. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, here's another, uh, another sort of master of the obvious kind of study that comes out. But, uh, but I think we get so much pushback from the like evidence based people that I just want to keep reinforcing that I think empiricism meets evidence a lot where you say, this is what we've been doing and this is why we've been doing it. And then at a later point or at a later date, suddenly that evidence pops up and you think, Oh, wow, there really is evidence for what these guys have been saying. They, they think they're seeing all along. And, and again, I think you always, I always get the fact that some people are, you know, always, you know, what about, is there a study does this? And, and you know me, I kind of, I always say sort of, you know, let the science lead us, but let's not let the science dictate, you know, let's be evidence based or maybe evidence led. But I think you also have to use your, your empirical knowledge and what you're seeing because these researchers really can't impact the number of people for the length of time that we are. And so I always think, and I've said this over and over again and people get mad, but good coaches are going to be ahead of good researchers just based on, number of exposures. I mean, if I go into the gym this morning, we've got a hundred people training and I'm able to look at what effect something has on a hundred people. And obviously I can't document that. I can't do a research study. I can't control for all these variables, but I can still see what the effect of any particular intervention is on that group of a hundred people. And does it, is it a positive change or is it a negative change? And if it's a positive change, we go with it. Yeah. And I think another thing is sometimes it's you know, these studies have a certain population, so college kids, or, you know, who knows how well they're being coached with certain things. Like, I think Brett Jones would always argue about some of the FMS studies that people did on their own. He said, well, I saw the video of it, and they weren't, they didn't do the instructions like we told them to do. Or, you know, so there's always these other things involved. So, obviously, it's never one thing. We need to look at uh, a lot of different things. So, kind of having that balance there balance and everything is always good exactly uh coach you had um a lot of lot we got a lot of play on this one you had um we had posted why i hired uh a uh the, the sports first director of character development article and we got a lot of uh a lot of play and uh, I, you you always said I like I always like this quote I like to say sports can build character or create characters. Can you just go over like really some things that you feel like if you're gonna talk to somebody if you if I made you do a lecture on building character for strength coaches what is our responsibility what what can we do to kind of help build character? Well. I think we have a huge responsibility and I've always, and I think I said that later on in the thread, I have always said that in, in at least a collegiate setting, your strength and conditioning coach is going to be the person that creates your culture because that person will have more contact, more number of days, more number of hours with your players than you will if you're coaching the sport. That's just the way that it works because, and obviously in some sports like ice hockey, as the season gets longer, it, you know, maybe it rivals it a little bit, but I still don't think, you know, if we look at the season starting in September and the season going to April and you think, you know, how many months that is and, you know, maybe you get them for two hours a day, I'm still going to get them over the course of that summer, you know, or spring for, you know, more like, you know, eight hours a week that is going to allow me to, to have a lot of impact. And, and I think basic things like I went, I think everything that you do, because uh, one of my favorite quotes is the way you do anything is the way you do everything in terms of if you let little things go, then more little things are going to go. I've always said, you know, we need to run the strength and conditioning program the way we run our program, the way we run our practice, which means just stuff like people have to be on time. People have to be respectful. People have to be in uniform. Anything that that my head coach would expect during his practice time, I need to expect that during strength and conditioning time. Now you apply that you take that to the private sector and you think, okay, you know, how would I want somebody to behave and it's even you know you know me i always go back to the music we do not allow music with obscenities we do not allow music that's you know racially charged even though that may not be considered an obscenity those are things that we don't permit we don't permit shirts that glorify drug or alcohol use uh we don't permit shirts that again have obscenities on them you know there are things and people might look and think Oh, that's, you know, small stuff. You guys are sweating small stuff. I'm like, absolutely. We sweat the heck out of the small stuff. 
and even the way, although you know I, I've been prone to probably use a bad word here and there, even you know trying to be good about you know how are our languages, how we're going to talk to kids, that our tone of voice, the words we're going to use, all that stuff goes into creating the culture because I think you show the athletes how they're supposed to treat each other. And you do that by your example, and you do that by how you allow them to treat each other, even to the point of, you know, and you know, I think bullying is an overused word, but I think you've got to be really careful about how you allow athletes to treat each other. You know, like I don't like the oh, freshmen clean up, you know, that kind of thing in college. I'm like, no, everybody cleans up. I clean up, you clean up. You know, we didn't bring the freshmen here to be our janitors, and and all of those things, and it goes back kind of to the legacy thing, you know, leaders sweep the sheds, you know, providing a really good example. It was funny, Nika posted a video of us the other day filling sandbags, you know, and I'd gone to Home Depot and I'd gotten play sand and I was filling the new sandbags that we bought. And, and she said, you know, the leaders, her title was Leaders Sweep the Sheds, you know, and here's Bob and Mike out back filling sandbags. And I don't think a lot about that stuff, but again, I think it's it does provide a good positive example to our workers that yeah. if we're, you know, if we're filling sandbags and we're loading the dumpster and we're picking up trash off the floor, that yes, do I expect you to do that? Yes. Am I going to walk by a piece of trash and say to you, hey, Anthony, pick that up? Never. Do you know what I mean? You're never going to be in that situation if you're working with me. Even the way you use language, I would never introduce people. I say, this is, you know, Kevin works with me. Kevin and I work together. You know, I don't tell people, oh, Kevin works for me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, again, that's language. But all that language matters, whether it's about kids, whether it's about coworkers, whether it's about the facility. Like, there's just so much when you think about character development that goes into this process of trying, you know, we even talk about, you know, trying to create a, pro- a positive brand, trying to create a positive image. How am I going to behave, you know, on my social media? If I'm on my social media and, you know, I'm MFing people and swearing and, you know, acting like a jerk, it's like, I, I yell at kids, you know, it's simple things. Like I've had kids spit on the turf and I'm like, go get a paper towel and wipe it up. And they kind of look at you like, well, I'm like, go get a paper towel and wipe it up. You don't spit in here. You, you know what I mean? And it's all simple stuff. But if you continue to do those things, you know, people will always come and watch MBSC and think like, what a great environment. You know, everybody's working. Everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Everybody's enjoying it. And I'm like, yeah, it's that way because we've spent 20 years making it that way. And part of that was, you know, having you know, the football players and the football players used to come in and throw the weights in the ground. I'm like, don't throw the weights. Those are my ways. I pay for them, you know, and, you know, they all, they think it's you know, part of the show, you know, get chalk flying around, throw the weights in the ground. You don't set I'm like, no, 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 you're not going to do that here. And some of that is because again, do I want to intimidate my, my female clients, my female athletes who are in here, you know, and I've got some big, you know, moron football player who's screaming and yelling and throwing things around the weight room. No, you know, I, tell, I used to tell people all the time, that's, you know, you don't, you're not proving to me you're any stronger by throwing the weights in the ground. You're proving to me you're weaker if you can't pick them up. And put them down and don't lift them. You know, lift them. And I mean, I've had those conversations over and over and over. But for us, it's become so much a part of our culture that that's what everybody expects. Sorry, that was a really long rim. Yeah. Well, I thought that picture that she put up, uh, that Nika put up, was uh, you and Bob filling the uh, money bags out and back. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know what? That's a gold. That was gold powder. Gold, gold powder. Yeah. <laughs> the um. The, the thing that I have a problem with is uh, I agree with you on the music. I was talking to somebody, and they were playing this music, and there was these young people in. And his excuse was, oh, come on. These guys can listen to whatever they want as soon as they walk out of here. I'm like, I don't care what they listen to when they walk out, but you're in control here, and you should set that tone. And then because there's, there's athletes, and then there's women in there. And then so, like, you have these – Women listening to some of these songs that are just, I mean, I just think it's completely disrespectful, number one. But I just think, you know what? If I was a parent, I wouldn't want to send my kid in here. I don't care. I'd like, for example, Michaela, you you have no control over what she listens to over the last, like, three years, let's say, right? Like, you don't know what she's listening to on her, whether she's with her friends, etc. But when you can control what she's listening to, that's your job. You've done the best you can. I think it's the same way in the gym. Yeah, I think, and in all honesty, I mean, I've, I've done it. I mean, we've had fights about, you know, when I was paying for the Apple account or whatever it was, you know, the iTunes account. I'm like, don't download. You know, do not download explicit music. Do not download explicit music and expect me to pay for that mm. because I, I don't want to pay for that. You know, you download download a version that that's acceptable for everybody. You know, because again, 
what happens is that stuff starts to sneak into their language and then it starts to come out and we've had discussions slash arguments about that in terms of language that gets used and it's sort of oh this is how everybody talks this is how everyone talks in the locker room and i'm like fine it's not the way i want you to talk here it's not what i expect to to get and so you know i do think I, i'm a huge believer like i said that everything matters and that if you continue and you know some people are like oh you, you know you're such a pain in the ass you so you know you know you don't give anybody a break it's like no i don't you know, yeah, and people know, like you should see the people running around. Cause sometimes someone will plug their phone in if our music system's not working and then they'll realize the song's going to come on. And I mean, I got, you know, adults, 25, 30 years old, running to their iPod trying to fast forward the song because they know I'm going to yell at them. <laughs> I still yell at them. I mean, I used to break their CDs at BU. I literally tell them, I said, you bring in a CD with this stuff on it. I'm going to take it out of the CD player. I'm going to break it in half. I'm going to put it in the trash can. And guys would do it. You know, they'd spend all this time downloading music and putting it on a CD and bringing the CD in. And then I'd hit a song, I'd go in and take out a CD player, I'd break it, I'd put it around the trash. It's like, I told you I was going to break it and throw it in the trash. And that's what I would do. But after a while, kids, you know, and it was the same thing. As you said, you know, you've got, you've got parents, you've got recruits. I mean, I can remember when I was, I, that was one of my big beefs when I worked for the Red Sox was that I couldn't do that. In a professional environment, it's a lot harder to do. And, you know, we had players, we had some really strong Christian guys who didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't swear, who would literally leave the clubhouse, the dressing room, and go upstairs. They'd be like, oh, you're playing country up here, this is where I can't stay downstairs and listen to that stuff anymore. Because some of it, I mean, so I, I, because I haven't been exposed to it, I'd hear some of the lyrics that some of the, the pro guys would have on their iPods, and I just was shocked, like, that's a song? Like, I you know, know, I wouldn't even say the words, you know, on, on the podcast, but... I was literally like, that. that's a song? Like, those are musical lyrics? That's pr protected by free speech? <laughs> yeah, it gets pretty bad. <laughs> oh, it does. I mean, crazy bad. Yeah. Um, all right, good stuff. Well, that was a great article. I'll remind everybody. I think we put it as free, so anybody can can read that. It was because uh, it was on somebody else's site, but um, uh, really good article and, and sparked some great conversation, as always, on the forum. So, Coach, we're going to let you go. Thanks for coming on, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks, Ian. I'd like to talk to you about some motor control screens. We're extremely excited to introduce these and we've been using these tools for quite some time to enhance our feedback loop. And I wanna to talk to you about how we do that and why we do that. In functional movement screening and in clinical movement assessment, we look at movement patterns, but we love to have additional testing that tells us or confirms what we found and what we can do about that. In orthopedics, we often look at the human body and its motor control system in quarters. I want to talk to you about both of those terms independently. Motor control, what does that really mean? If you've ever heard the word stability, coordination, timing, synergy, balance, that's motor control. And motor control is a good global term that is scientifically correct because many times we can change your balance and your coordination in a single session. We should be measuring that because it's excellent feedback. And when we don't change it, we should be measuring that because it's excellent feedback. By having a feedback loop on motor control, we really know if our corrective measures or our treatments or some of our exercise choices have done the right thing for your central nervous system. Because when a small motor control screen gets better, a little coordination test gets better in a single session, that means the neurological system likes what you did. Whether you treated somebody or trained somebody, it's a really good touch point or baseline to realize this was a productive session, we're gonna hit this thing again. Or, hey, I can't measure that we did anything, I have enough evidence to do something different next time. How do you think we arrived at maybe some of the exercise choices that we like better than others? Simply by what the measurement tells us. That feedback loop in many times saves you time from doing a whole nother screen or whole nother assessment just to redirect. Remember, that feedback can be gained in seconds. And so we took what we learned from comparing a motor control screen like uh, the Y balance test with three different directions and finding what's the one direction we could reach that will show us something in the upper and lower body. When that changes, we've got feedback that we did something right. Now, I wanna go specifically into detail of what each of these looks like and why we're doing it this way. And we're gonna show you exactly how to do it. 
Hey everyone, this is the Business of Fitness segment here on the Strength Coach Podcast. My name is Alan Cosgrove and I'm going to do this entire segment in a Scottish accent just to keep you guys interested. Right, This is the part of the podcast where we try to help you with your businesses and make more money. What we're going to talk about this time is an audit of yourself. Right? Every three months, a good strategy to do is to sit down and look at where, what do you do every day? Where's your skill set? Like, let's think about training clients, assessment, does program design, exercise selection, cueing exercises, coaching them, motivating people. Do we talk about nutrition? Do we talk about motivation? How do we follow up with these clients and make a list of everything you do in your job, including things like marketing, sales? Right, lead generation, uh, management skills, put all these things down and then be brutally honest. And on a scale of one to 10, I want you to rank yourself on these areas. So every 90 days you go through everything. And if you're like, you know, I'm okay at assessment, but I'm not truly world-class. That's my lowest skill. Well, we have to get better at that or we have to find someone who will do that for our business in order to get to the next level. So the easy way to do this is every 90 days you go through this list and you find your bottom three, right? Or even your bottom one. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter which, uh, how many you do at a time. But the concept is every 90 days we're going to make an audit of our own business and ourselves, and we're going to move it to the next level by putting studying. So, for example, if it was assessment, I think the functional movement guys are excellent at assessments. If you're not strong at assessments and you haven't read everything that they've put out, then that's where I would start. I would look at their material and their stuff, right? So that's the that's the idea. We call this a self-audit. You do it for your business. You do it for yourself as, as a human being. And it's really just how to upgrade yourself, right? Where's your weakest area and how to upgrade it? And then it's a, a guy called Darren Hardy who... Uh, he he does a similar thing where he goes. If you want to improve something, you take the you get the top five books on the topic from Amazon, and then you get three audio programs that you can listen to going to work uh, to and from work every day. And you try to find one live event where you can go and do a total immersion and learn everything about it. So he calls it his five three one five books, three audio programs, and one live event. Let's make it a one one one. Right, one book, one audio program, and one live event, or one one type of home study course. But when you implement that, then you upgrade yourself, you upgrade your business, and you take it to the next level. It's just really looking at like the way you'd look at a client's training program to see exercises that they're weak at or areas they're not strong at. Guys, that's it for this this episode. This is Alan Cosgrove from ResultsFitnessUniversity.com, and I'll talk to you guys next time. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach. And today I have on Jana Heitmeyer. And Jana is the Director of Sports Nutrition at Baylor. And, um, well, first of all, Jana, thanks for doing this. Absolutely. All right, well, you're kind of the first um, person, I think, in this role. Like, we've had nutritionists on here, et cetera. But when uh, Brian Mann had sent me an email, I was like, you really got to get Jana on. And I said, all right, cool. So we talked a little bit. And, uh, you know, I think it's a – it's a uh, not – I don't want you to take this the wrong way. But, like, I can feel like sometimes, you know, I have this picture of – like a guidance counselor where, you know, a lot of people like it's an, it can be an important role, but sometimes like you really have to connect with the kids. And like sometimes people might think, well, yeah, yeah, Jenna, I know my, I know I'm supposed to have fruits and vegetables. So great. You know, uh, but I, I just wanted to see what exactly your job is and then kind of find out how you're educating and, and reaching some of the, the, the students. So first of all, let's start out with, you know, what your job entails every day and what really, what you're responsible for. So I'm responsible for all the sports that are at Baylor. Anything that has to do with nutrition, whether that's travel meals, whether that's meals on the road, whether that's catered meals here, body composition, supplements, um, any type of counseling. So if they have any allergies or anything, you know, all the boring stuff, I would say, the sciencey boring stuff of just if they have gluten allergies or cheese or nuts or mm-hmm. et cetera, just finding ways for them to get food. Um, and then anything other than that, it's pretty much just how to make them recover better, faster, so that they're available when the coaches need them so we can be successful in the field. 
Cool. Now, I would I I assume this has got to be super hard because you just mentioned so many things, right? <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, travel and then what they're eating. Like, are so who are you really? Like, let's start there. Who are you working with? Are you working with – because you can't control everything that they're doing, obviously. So are you working with the cafeteria? Are the, are the teams eating? Because I would assume you have to coordinate this with each coach. So talk to us about yeah. how you're making those, you know, uh, those decisions. So we're – luckily, we have an athletic dining hall that feeds our athletes nice. and our chef in there. And I work pretty close together to figure out – a, what foods are going to make them want to eat there? So that's not just, ew, it's a dining hall. Ugh. Yeah. But B, also makes them want to eat the food once they get in there. So how are we going to get them food that they actually need and make them want to continue to come back here to get all of their meals? Because we feel like our food is better than anywhere else they're going to go. So our overall goal is we work with them. We work with the chefs in there. We also work with any of the support staff with the teams. So director of operations, run it past the head coach. We work with the strength and conditioning coach. We work with the team doctors. We work with the athletic training staff. We work with our sports science staff or our applied department here as well. So that's a wide variety. We're kind of a behind the scenes, talk to everybody, make stuff happen where you're not really seeing it. Yeah. Now, that's got to be hard also because obviously, you know, let's just say I'm the strength coach and I'm paleo and I think that's the best way. And then, you know, then you have chefs who have their own opinion and maybe some coaches who have their own opinion. So what challenges do you have within that? And we've struggled with that in every, literally in every facet. So we'll have coaches that say things like, I'm not eating any sugar. Why are the guys allowed to eat sugar? Or I'm going to do a low carb. Why can't my girls do low carb type of stuff? So what we try to do as part of our education, make sure that we hit all of those people. So while, and, and you know, our main message being, is, while it's good for you because you're not out here competing, we need to do something different for these kids because they're younger, they're doing more, it's different, their bodies are different than it is for you. So we spend a lot of time doing in-services. We spend a lot of time talking to the coaches and just letting them get to know us so they feel comfortable having conversations like that. And it's not coming up later like, oh, well, my coach told me, blah, blah, blah. Luckily, that doesn't happen as much because our coaches are a little bit, and everybody, the support staff, is pretty educated on what is appropriate for their athletes. Let's leave your own personal beliefs out of that. Yeah. How um, How long – I mean, well, first of all, do big universities – how common is this athletic dining hall? Athletic dining hall? That one that you said you had, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends. There's some places that use like one of the dining halls in the dorms or somewhere else on campus and then just maybe shut it down for one meal so that it's athletes only. I want to say that there's only, I know there's less than 10 dining halls that are like actually structurally built just for athletes in the country. There might be even less than that just because of the expense of building an entire building and staffing and no one else gets to eat there. So they start out, you know, let's, let's combine. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So is it with different teams or, I mean, like, I'm wondering in terms of, let's stay in the dining hall thing now, is it really the same for everybody or, it, like, for example, you know, if the football team's coming in and they need more calories, et cetera, are, are, are different teams getting different, different meals? How does this whole thing work? No, so we just make sure, and again, our chef is, fantastic. She makes sure there's something for every sport in there. So if there's right when they walk in the door, they have fruits and vegetables right in front of their face, obviously benefiting to everybody. Then they walk over, over to where the actual hot food starts. And then they always have grilled chicken and grilled and grilled salmon available to them plus grilled veggies. So that's always an option for people that are saying, I need to lose weight or I want to be super healthy or whatever it is. They always have some type of action station. So it's pasta or stir fry or burritos or something along those lines where they kind of put it together and choose what the ingredients they want in there. Mm -hmm. And then we have what we call a comfort station. And we always do something that's a little bit unhealthy. It might be fried chicken. It might be brisket. It might be ribs. They always do something a little bit healthier. And then we always do a vegetable and then some type of potato. But then we also have a carving station that might be prime rib. It might be lamb chops. It might be buffalo. It might be, I mean, there's a wide variety of stuff that they can choose from. So there's literally something for everyone. And our goal is to provide you with all those options so that you have to make the choice to walk past the pizza and maybe choose the healthier stuff based on where you are in your training schedule and what's coming up for you competition wise. And other people are just trying to gain weight or lose weight. So they choose whatever they want. 
Nice. Now, um, this is so interesting because I just feel like um, I, I, it's amazing because so many people should have, <laughs> so many schools should have this. Um, what, what about working with individuals? Now, has that kind of lessened the need to work individually and now you're kind of working, let's just say, with the problems or the special cases? I think it's always been like that. So our main goal is we want them to be self-sufficient. I always tell them I cannot be inside your pocket. As much as I wish I could smack food out of your hand, I cannot. But our big goal is when we get into situations like that, because there's going to be times when you're on the road and you have per diem, and I'm not there to tell you, no, you can't go to Taco Bell right now. You have to go, I don't know, somewhere at Applebee's and get a grilled chicken instead. Like they have to be able to be in those situations educated enough to know this is the food that's going to help me right now. And the only way they're going to do that is if we give them options in front of them that are bad and good. Yeah, almost so like I a, come through the dining hall. Nice, like almost similar to to um like uh, eat this, not that, where it's like yeah. okay, these are the these are the bad choices, but this is the least better. If you're going to go to Taco Bell, have this. Exactly, um, exactly. So if they are, you know, and everybody has their own preference of stuff too. So you're just trying to what's your best option at this place at this time for what I'm about to do. What should I pick? Yeah. So. Um. It's awesome. So talk to me a little bit more about the travel, because I think a lot of uh, coaches out there are going to struggle with this. And like you said, you can't, you're not traveling with every team um, Mm -hmm. and you can't be there. So how are you managing the travel? You said earlier, you know, you have to deal with the travel nutrition. How are you dealing with that? So a lot of times what we do is work with their director of ops to get their itinerary ahead of time. So let's say, volleyball is traveling down to Houston, for example, what we'll do is get their schedule. They'll tell us what meals they need. And then if they want it delivered to the hotel or if they're going to go there. And then for us, we just sit that, we take that information and research local restaurants. And then we give them like five options off of a menu. So this local restaurant sounds good for pregame. Here's five options for you guys. You pick one through five, whichever one you want. And then we'll put on like, you know, the, the extras, the side dishes and stuff as well on there. But that way we know they're getting at least some good food, some good choices instead of just saying, okay, well, we're here. Let's just park. And you guys can go to any of these five restaurants. It's just, it's easier if we're picking the choices for them. So we know they're getting good fuel before they need it. Yeah. And it's probably as time has gone on, it's been easier because obviously you're going to a lot of the same schools, Mm -hmm. like they're playing. So once you have that area down, you're like, oh, cool, go to, you know, Smith's restaurant over there. Exactly, okay. exactly. You start to get contacts, and it's nice. Cool. So what um, what personal contact do you – do you have a staff? How much of a staff do you have? I have one full-time, and I have one part-time okay. worker. Okay. So what, um, what individual contact do you have with athletes? In terms of – You know, just like speak – like – somebody who comes in like so if I'm an athlete are you working specifically on somebody's diet or is it always going to be more of a general team and these are the good choices etc how much are you working with somebody like if I come in and I'm on the football team or I'm uh, and I'm like no I need some special help how much do you have to do that a lot (laughs) actually so our goal is kind of like how you said at the beginning like kind of a guidance counselor picture we try to not be like that So we try not to do things where it's like formal meetings, sit in your office, unless it's necessary. So there's times when eating disorder-wise or special allergy cases where you have to sit down and talk in your office. But for the most part, our goal is to give you general information as a group, as a team. And then from there, we follow up with you by coming to practice and talking to you in the weight room, um, in between meals when you're here, actually at the meal times. So there's a lot of times people ask me, how often do you meet with kids during the week? If I'm working with someone, it's probably like six or seven times a day, but it's not sitting in your office meeting. It's literally on the go in a real time moment of, okay, I'm in the lunch. I'm at lunch right now. Can you come over and help me? Yes. And then let's talk a little bit more about what you're doing over here. So that way it just helps them apply. And then we kind of phase them out. So our, our goal is to meet with all the freshmen when they come in, we do a 30 minute meeting with them. And then we kind of see and adjust based on their needs of what's next for them. And we just kind of, as you go through their first year, start to teach them, teach them, teach them as they get it, phase them out. And then their job is to kind of help the younger kids pass the message on. And then we just kind of keep going year by year. Nice. Do you, what, let's, let's kind of segue this into technology. Okay. Um, 
are you like using any tracking uh, technology to kind of help them in the beginning, especially? We do for specifically just for nutrition. We have a DEXA machine, which is a commonly used for bone density in hospitals for women, seeing how close they are to osteoporosis, et cetera. Okay. Obviously, we're using it a little different. <laughs> so we're measuring muscle, bone, and fat down to the gram, and it tells us where it's at in their body. So we are tracking that information from the time they step on campus all the way until they finish their senior year. How many times? And depending on the team. So for football, we do it about four times a year. Um, for other sports, we might do it once or twice, but we try to do like a preseason, end of preseason, maybe mid-competition season, and then off-season. So we're just getting information about how your training is being affected. Um, we talk a lot about, you can tell things on there, not proven by research, purely by the fact I've read a billion scans of just, am I sleeping? Am I overtrained, undertrained? How's my muscle mass doing? Am I eating correctly? Enough calories, not enough calories? You can get a lot of information without them telling you that starts a conversation to get them back on the right track. And has that, like, for example, um, Coach Boyle always talked about using the FMS in the very beginning uh, with his hockey players and starting to get a, a sense of what hockey players' movement would look like so they would make general recommendations because it was almost like, you know, 80-20 rule. Have you found that, like, you're able to look at, like, the football team and, okay, guys, you guys seem to be doing this, you know, and talking to the coaches. Yeah. Have you found some good generalizations that you can work with specifically uh, with teams? Yes. It's hard because every person in their body is different, so they react differently. We found more that you can give some generalizations like, hey, I'm a softball player. I play in the outfield. I need to be between here percentage-wise and here. But you're always going to have outliers and people that don't fit within that grid that you have to manipulate and change and make special cases for. So, yes, you can do generalizations, but more often than not, it's very individualized to how their body recovers, what they've been doing, how they've been sleeping that gives my results a skewed, I wouldn't say skewed, but it gives my results a different number that then comes back and I'm like, okay, let's have a conversation about this. And it might be, you need 10 extra minutes of sleep versus this other person that plays your same position. It's the same size, just genetics wise. So I think that plays a big role into it more so to make it more individualized. <laughs> Absolutely. What about body fat percentages? Um, obviously men and women are different. Um, mm -hmm. What are some numbers that you might give us across different sports that you maybe you guys would like to see? So again, it's hard to do that because there isn't anything that's because people are so different, especially yeah. on a DEXA, there's nothing out there that says that. Yeah. So we literally have just generalized to the point of 21 to 30 for females. And then I would say 12 to 15 or 10 to 15 for guys. And then again, we have guys that are 5% and we have guys that are 35%. Yeah. So it's hard to say. It's really hard to say based on sport. So like, for example, for our offensive linemen, we want them to be under 30% body fat. Most people would look at that and be like, that's really high. But if you're looking at a DEXA, I'm getting every piece of fat in your body around your organs, you know, on the outside, right underneath your skin. I'm getting it in between your muscles. I'm getting all of it. So there's no hiding from that. It's not like on a pinch test where – Oh, I just happened to carry all my fat around my organs, but you can't you can't pinch anything in the skin. Yeah. Like your number is going to be skewed. <clears throat> so it just makes it it's easy for us, but it's really hard to give them a general number. We just try to by position for football is probably the only one that we've literally said this is kind of what we're looking at based on what the coaches want. Yeah, yeah. No, I was talking to Mark Fitzgerald from the Anaheim Ducks, and like, they'd like to see those players. Obviously, these are professional athletes, but you mm -hmm. know, 10% for the hockey players. Um, right. So I just wanted to see if there was any anything out there. Now, this deck's up. Man, I wanted to come down there and do it because <laughs> I've, been, I've been on a program for like the last seven weeks. So I've been doing the in-body, which I've been doing a pretty advanced <laughs> in-body, so it's been telling me. You know, visceral fat as well. Like, just gives me a number. Doesn't tell me specifically, but now I want even more information. See, it's funny. The more information we get, the more we want. It's so crazy. Right. And it hurts your feelings. That's why I always tell them it's going to hurt your feelings at first. Like our coaches always come down and they don't understand because it's kind of a new technology, and they'll come down and be like, "I want to do it." And they get on. They're like, "I don't ever want to see that again." Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of a kick in the face, but it gives you the truth, and then you move from there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I gotta say, my first in body, I was like, 
what? I've been working for the last three months. I mean, I'm a, <laughs> right. you know, and then I looked at my age. I'm like, no, all right, I'm doing okay. Yeah, um, okay. So um, let's go. All right, so you got Dexa. Any other, like, um, like tracking uh, technology or anything that you're using? We do a little bit with our – so our applied department does a ton of stuff with tracking in terms of GPS and heart rate monitors and omega waves and TMG. So they do a lot of it with that. And we kind of piggyback onto that with body weights and we may look at like players that have heavy loads during practice and then adjust our recovery protocols based off of that. But otherwise, in terms of specific for nutrition only, there is, we don't do anything else. Okay. So like just even like uh, food logs or anything like that, or how are you, oh, yeah. you do that? Mm-hmm. So we don't, I don't believe in writing meal plans. <clears throat> the reason being if they're going to end up in the trash can within five seconds of you walking out of my office because I don't know what food you have, and no matter what I say, you're going to go home and think, I don't really want that today. So it's going to yeah. it's gonna go out the window. <laughs> so we do a lot more with plates, like how to fill your plate and what your plates should look like so you can kind of carry it around in every situation. But we'll have them log food or take pictures of food or something so that we can see it a little bit better. But we've used MyFitnessPal a little bit. Um, that's helped us kind of get a good picture of where they're at, we, especially if we're trying to teach them you know, some of the vitamins and minerals and we're targeting something specific, but really we just have them write it down. We'll plug it in and then just kind of look at the deficiencies overall. Yeah. That works pretty well. Cause you, they can, they can actually take a picture within the app yes. for something that they're eating. And then it does kind of give them a good sense of like what the macros might be, even if they don't know at the moment what that even means for them. So exactly. Um, Cool. Are you getting texts like twenty four seven of like people like at two o'clock in the morning? Guys are out <laughs> and they're, they're just like, "I'm me having this pizza, Coach." Yes. Unless you tell me no in five minutes, I'm gonna eat Taco Bell. I'm like, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, I'll go home. <laughs> nice. So, um, let's go into some supplementation because I know it's a tricky uh, subject with the college athletes. Mm-hmm. So. Give us a rundown of uh, some of the rules that you have for supplementation, like from the uh, NCAA, and then um, what are some things that you can and can't do, and then how you're educating your athletes on that. So we have, luckily they have some computer programs that help make our lives much easier. Um, Overall, what we try to do is focus on supplements that are NSF certified. So they're certified for sport. And you can go online and they actually have an app on your phone as well that kids can download, be able to check brands and different types of supplements when they're out and about. Okay. Our general rule of thumb is you are not allowed to buy anything unless it comes from my mouth that I told you to do it to the point where I give them a post-it note to take to the stores if, I, if they go anywhere. And you are only allowed to buy anything on this post-it. And if they have questions and want you to buy something else, you tell them they have to call me and talk to me about it. Okay. Anything to protect them. That's our goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it has to have the NSF certification. But in general, that's going to be okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So then there's some things that we go off of that on. So there's some protein powders and stuff that typically are all usually fine. Um, we're looking for, you know, some of the more common popular brands for the most part. But if you're looking at just whey protein, we're doing okay. Our biggest goal, so NCAA tells us we can serve just four categories of supplements. And they actually just lifted one of our rules. So we were allowed to do protein now with any amount of protein in it that we want. So now we can do things like just isolates or, you know, just straight, literally straight protein with nothing like other additives or fillers to make it a certain percentage of the product. So that's been helpful to be able to allow us to provide a little bit more for our kids. We can also do electrolytes, which is like Gatorade stuff. Um, And then anything that falls into the vitamin or mineral category. Those are the main three things we can do. And then things like carbohydrate replacement, which would be like bars or chews or something like that. So those are the four that we're allowed to provide to them. So then other than that, they have to buy things on their own. So, for example, fish oil, if they wanted to take that, they have to buy that on their own. Creatine, if they want to buy that, it has to be on their own. Um, Glucosamine. So things that are still good for you but are either marked as a performance benefit or something through the NCAA, they have to actually buy. We can't give them. And then anything, obviously, steroids-wise, it's banned for them to buy. Yeah. Also. Well, what other things that they need to be careful? Like, is there, like, a caffeine limit? Is there, like, is, is there um, limits to some of these, like, you like creatine? Is there is there limits to certain, some of these things? I'm naive to all this with the No, you're good. So creatine, they're allowed, they can take, again, if they're taking it, we limit them to a certain amount based on just what's good for your body. But there's no NCAA rule for that. In terms of caffeine, there is, but it's literally, like, 
you have to drink eight cups of coffee equivalent wise right before you take the test for you to test positive as like too much stimulant for them, okay. like too much caffeine. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we just try to tell them, you know, as long as you're taking it as a pre-workout, as long as we're keeping things under control and you're not just literally taking straight caffeine pills all the day, we're doing okay. Nice. Nice. Um, talk to me about, uh, sleep because it's gotta be one of your biggest challenges as well with yeah. the kids and, you know, just never mind that they're out, par- they try, you know, they want to party, they want to do this, but they're traveling. Also, you know, they have to study and you know, all of all these other things. So mm-hmm. talk to us about sleep and how you're trying to get, uh, you know, educate the kids on sleep. It's, it is, it's so hard for them because there's so many things in their way, whether it's roommates, whether it's pets. But, I mean, there's just every distraction. Their phone is probably the number one. Like, they, you know, they can't put down their phones ever. They're just attached to them constantly. Yeah. So it's like a constant wakefulness <laughs> that's happening to them all the time. And then once they do sleep, a lot of them have insomnia or they're stressed out and they can't go to sleep anyway. So probably our biggest battle is trying to get them to go to bed and or stay asleep once they're there. So again, we work really close with our sports science department and have them help us educate with like, what's our room temperature supposed to be? How dark should our room be? How can I fix my phone so that it's not waking me up with the blue lights? Um, what should, so what kind of bedtime routine should I have? How long am I supposed to be aiming to sleep when I'm napping? What's my environment? How long should it be, et cetera. So we've had tons of talks with them about it's important to nap, but it can't be a six hour nap because <laughs> then, then yeah. you're sleeping. That's not a nap anymore, <laughs> but just trying to teach them about REM cycles and what's happening and why it's so important. It's a process. Cause again, we're not around them during that time at all. So there is no hands on when they're trying to take a nap or sleeping that we can come in and correct stuff it's really just them learning and absorbing and trying to fix it yeah and it it's interesting because i think i I just i read recently this year uh, earlier in the year i read uh sleep smarter with uh sean by sean stevenson and it was a really amazing book because i think it was similar to uh like the idea of a eat this not that where it was saying look here's 21 ideas, and we're going to expand on each one. We're going to give you research to sh- show you why it's important, but here's some ways that you can... So, for example, like, okay, they tell you to put the phone down, right? Okay, don't yeah. sleep by the phone. That's not happening, all right? Right. So, but I do, because I'm not single, I'm married, so it's okay. I can wear... I have blue blocker glasses that I'll wear at night, like after like 8 o'clock, right? Because <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. it's only my wife that's going to see me and... So, like, if I was single, I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be going out, you know, to get some pizza or a bar to, you know, (laughs) with my blue blockers at night. Right. But, you know, so, or, you know, I've done the nighttime, uh, you know, switch the nighttime uh, app or whatever on on the iPhone or I have F.Lux on my computer because I know these are things that I'm not going to uh, compromise. What are some things that you kind of, what are some strategies that you guys have said? Like, what is the room temperature? Have, are you guys giving them, uh, like the, uh, the eye, the eye shades? I sleep in eye shades a lot of times too now. So what are some things that you're, you know, kind of, what are the specific recommendations you're having? So we've been telling, um, when we travel, especially like specifically with the kids when they travel in hotel rooms, because the other problem is, they can't afford to turn their thermostat down as low as we would like them to have it for their room. Oh, yeah. Like when, like it's too expensive for them to be able to pay for that. <clears throat> so we tell them 60 to 62 is where we're looking at them to have their room temperature. We actually provide them also with eye shades. Um, and then we talk a lot about it, whatever you need, keep it close to your bed. So let's say that, you know, you're going to get up and need a drink of water or, you know, try to keep like a water bottle close to your bed. But then also when you're going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, try not to turn on any lights, like just use a very low, either a nightlight or something where you can just, you can see your way, but you're not turning on anything to wake up your brain. And we talked about using like the blocking the curtains, all the light blocking curtains. So it's like pulled the shades all the way. So your room is pretty much pitch black. One of our, Andy Altoff, our, one of our applied guys always tells them, if you can see your hand in front of your face when it's like five inches away, it's too bright in your room. Like you shouldn't be able to see your hand at all. And so I think some of that stuff has helped them a ton, mostly for travel, more so than even here. Yeah, yeah. Do you guys have, you have like a, a specific place where athletes live? Yes and no, because some of them live in the apartments also, so it's hard. I mean... 
their dorms are basically apartments and then they move off of campus and then we don't control it at all. Yeah. It's kind of wherever they are around Waco. Yeah. Cool. We, you and I talked about finding triggers. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to us about that for and how you're educating your the kids on um, helping them find some triggers for some of these things. So our biggest battle that we're fighting is that they are invincible 18 to 23 year olds that don't care about nutrition because they don't have to because their body is still young and productive and recovers very quickly. So the only way that we can be productive as nutrition staff is to find what makes them like, what do they care about that makes them then care about nutrition? So that's mostly why we meet individually with kids is just to find out what do you care about that makes you willing to change a habit that you have. So whether it's performance, whether it's I'm making the money for all my family right now, whether it's if I put on this little bit of weight, it actually makes me faster and it's been proven. Um, So it's just literally the conversations of what is going to make it so that you want to make this change. Like once, once they try it, that's the biggest goal. Once I can get them to try it for three days, very rarely do they completely quit after that and haven't made any changes. It's just the talking them into it, whether it's, can you spend the extra $5 to come to the dining hall every day instead of going out for lunch? Once you get them to try it and they get into that, then they're, then they're okay with it. It's just the, I don't really want to, I'd rather have Chick-fil-A. Yeah. It's too far. I have to park my car, you know? So you're kind of meeting them a little bit on, on their turf a little bit, like trying to find out what, and you know, really essentially what you just said is you're finding out the whys. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, I mean, because I, I did a goal setting workshop earlier in the year and, you know, we didn't just do the goals. We had to write down like a bunch of whys and put it in with the goal to kind of. So when we do a goal review, we're reminded of why we're doing this, because that's where people mm-hmm. start to they forget, like what kind of got them there. And um, so, yeah, finding out that why or finding out what's going to motivate them is uh, obviously pretty important. And it also, I mean, so you can go the opposite way too. You can find out why they're doing some of the things they're doing. Like we always battle when they come in the eating one meal a day. They're not used to having this much food available. They're not used to being able to choose all the stuff they want and eat unlimited amounts. So it can go one of two ways. They either refuse to get on board with the eating three meals a day or they go overboard and they're eating six times a day. So it's hard for them to change what you've grown up with for 18 years to come here and then say, you know, well, I was successful. I got here. Why do yeah. I have to change anything now? And it's just much more of then it becomes like education. Let's try. Let's see. How about this? Instead of just, you're doing it. Get over it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's funny because yeah, I mean, we, we do, we have these habits that are obviously, um, that, that's always the big, like I'm going through a change with my nutrition over the last six months. And so it, it really has been, I, what I found is um, that I made all these associations with certain things. Like for example, going to a game or, um, right. you know, watching a game or, or, you know, the, the wine will make me relax or yeah. what, you know, yep. all of these different things, you know, that you think is going to help you or you associate with. And those are really, for me, what was the hardest part. So that's got to be hard for you to find out what all these things are with, you know, limited staff and so many athletes to kind of get in everybody's head. You know who's harder, though? Coaches. Really? They are the hardest people because they want to make a change, but their lifestyle is not, (laughs) they don't want to change. They want to make the change, but not change. Well, can I still have the beer that I have at night? Can I still have my alcohol? I'm still going to be going recruiting. I'm going to have to eat out dinner and I don't want to give up this specific restaurant, food, whatever, wherever I'm at. They're actually way harder, (laughs) mostly because they know better, but they just don't want to change. So with you and the coaches, are you trying, are you guys trying to get the coaches to change because you want them to, you know, kind of be role models or are they coming to you and saying, Hey, I need some help. Or is it? They're coming to us. They are. They are. Yeah, Because you think kids are unmotivated to do it. Like your coach told you, you had to come and meet with me. Well, now it's like, well, you know, if you try to go to a coach, they're like, yeah, I'm good, whatever. And then they come all of a sudden, it's end of season. They're like, yeah, all that eating out that we did when we traveled, I'm about 30 pounds heavier. What do I need to do? Like, they're the ones that have to initiate. Otherwise, that's not happening. So they're easier on that end because once they come, they're actually motivated to actually make an attempt to try. Whereas the kids, it's like, that's when you really have to get to know them to figure out 
their motivation and what's going to be their trigger to let's go. Very cool. Well, this has been uh, very enlightening. And I just, I, you know, I still, I still feel like you got a super tough job, but I feel <laughs> like at least you're there like with the dining hall and, um, and uh, some of the things that you're doing and kind of uh, going around. I can see why Brian wanted to get me to get you on the show. So uh Jenna, thanks so much for doing this. It's been uh, really cool to kind of uh, see some of the some of the things that you guys are doing at Baylor. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. All right, that's going to do it for episode 208 of the Shrank Coach Podcast. Special thanks to Chris Barrier and the folks over at Perform Better. You can check them out at performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Perform Better is doing their Get a free pack of mini bands when you spend over $50 right now. They also have items on sale like super bands, FMS test kits, first place fitness mats, and the Economy Ultimate Sandbag. The summits are here. Providence is the next stop on June 22nd. Remember, register at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Jana Heitmeyer for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength, conditioning, performance, enhancement, and nutrition. Alan Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University Business and Fitness segment. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Gray Cook and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. And remember, you can try out shrinkcoach.com for three days just to buck you access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. To access that offer, go to strengthcoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. My name's Anthony Renner. You can reach me at strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time. <laughs>